In many ways, Darwin's ideas were completely revolutionary at, at the time of the publication of The Origin of Species. But in many other ways, he really built on the ideas of people who came before him and ideas that were sort of in the wind at, during his time. And there were vast differences between the ways his ideas were received by the public in general and how they were received within the scientific community. So the purpose of this web lecture is to give you some historical perspective about the ideas that led up to Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and the ways in which it has been modified since his work. So the learning objectives for this lesson are first to describe how people thought about questions of diversity prior to Darwin. Secondly, to think about this idea of special creation differs from the ideas that Darwin discussed and how questioning the assumptions underlying this idea of special creation paved the way for evolutionary thinking. Third, to distinguish the ways in which Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was and was not revolutionary among scientists as compared to the general public, and to talk a little bit about the major gap in Darwin's theory, why it was such a stumbling block to its acceptance during Darwin's time, and then understand how the modern field of genetics closed that gap and really completed Darwin's theory of evolution. This idea of dealing with diversity really goes back as far as human communication, the need to be able to discuss different kinds of plants and animals to know what's dangerous, what's safe, what's good to eat, what's not. So the naming and classification of organisms, do we want to eat the beautiful cherry flavored mushrooms that look like they have candy buttons on them, or do we want to eat the drab, brown, unappetizing looking mushrooms? It's important to be able to communicate that kind of information. So humans developed a naming system to be able to communicate information about different, different organisms uh, in the world. But the first time that this kind of classification and naming system was really formalized was by a botanist named Carlos Linnaeus in the 18th century. And he was really the father of taxonomy. He was the one who originally developed this hierarchical classification system that we still use quite a bit today. So taxonomy is the science of describing, naming, and classifying species of living or fossil organisms. And of course, we have this system of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species that are based on overall similarities between organisms. Species that had a great deal of similarity, were grouped together in two genera, and so on and so on, based on whatever similar features he could recognize and describe. At the time that Linnaeus was doing this, the prevailing idea about how all of these species came to be was this idea of special creation. Pretty much every culture has its creation story uh, represented by this picture of different creation stories. But the idea of special creation has a couple of distinctive features. First of all, it's the assertion that all species were created exactly as we see them today. There is no change through time of species. Earlier species do not give rise to later species. Everything was created on the earth exactly as we find it now. And Linnaeus believed in special creation, and he believed that this organizational system reflected the divine plan of creation, that the creator grouped these organisms when he created them in a way similar to the way Linnaeus later grouped them, and that his study of the diversity of life and his study of taxonomy was actually a study of one component of the mind of the creator. And there was also this idea that species were created in the relatively recent past. This Archbishop Usher that you heard about on the first day of class was actually a real person that really did calculate the age of the earth based on the ages of the prophets and computed that it was about 6,000 years old. Up until this time, when we thought about diversity, we're thinking mostly about the pattern of diversity. So 
Around the 18th century, we started to discover the fossil record, and we started to see the remains of animals that were quite different from the organisms that we see today. And so this led some thinkers to start to question this idea that species, organisms, do not change over time, that maybe these fossil species that were being discovered that were not identical to any species that are alive now might have been the precursors to species that are alive. And so several thinkers started proposing this idea of gradual change through time. One was a French anatomist, Comte de Buffon, who wrote a great deal about what we call the transmutation of species, the gradual change through time of species to account for the fossil record. Another one in England was actually the grandfather of Charles Darwin, Erasmus Darwin, who dabbled in natural history. He was a poet, a prolific writer, and he wrote a great deal about the possibility that, that species might change through time. So these thinkers early on in the 18th century began to describe this pattern of evolution and that this gradual change through time might help to explain the diversity of living species that we see and certainly would explain the fossil diversity. Archbishop Usher, his thinking was very, very influential throughout Europe during the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. And so it was fairly commonly accepted that the Earth was only about 6,000 years old. So these observations and these ideas that species could change gradually through time were a little bit hard for most people to accept because there simply was not enough time available for very small changes to create these large changes that would be needed to explain the diversity of living organisms. So it kind of makes sense if you believe that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, that this idea of species gradually changing through time would be absolutely outrageous because there simply was not enough time available. These ideas began to be uprooted around the early 19th century when farmers and surveyors and others who made a habit of digging around in the ground started discovering layers in the earth. Layers that appeared to represent sort of an orderly deposit of um, different layers, different strata of the earth in a very regular way such that the oldest layers you found deeper in the earth and the newer layers were found closer to the surface. And this idea that the earth itself was the result of these processes that laid down these layers of the earth was formalized by actually a contemporary of Charles Darwin. His name was Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell was the foremost geologist of his day, very, very highly respected. So he was a friend and colleague to Darwin, and he calculated, based on the strata that he found and the processes that created those strata, the sedimentation of different layers based on the geological structures found in England that he was studying. He calculated that the Earth must be older than 300 million years, an unimaginable amount of time for a society that did not think that the world was any older than 6,000 years. And he proposed this idea, which was revolutionary at the time, that the geological features that we see in the world today were formed by the exact same processes that we can observe, things like sedimentation, erosion, these very, very slow, gradual processes that in your lifetime would not make a difference of more than a couple of millimeters, but over millions and millions and millions of years, they can form mountains, valleys, gulches, all of the geological features that we see right now. And this idea is known as uniformitarianism. What uniformitarianism means is that we can explain the features that we see in the world based on processes that we can observe in our own time, working over vast, vast, vast uh, stretches of time to have a large effect. This is in contrast with the previous idea known as catastrophism, which believed that 
the geological structures that we see were the result of catastrophic events on a scale that we have never experienced in our lifetimes. Devastating floods, humongous earthquakes, volcanic eruptions on a scale that could create these large-scale features in a single event rather than very minute, small processes building up over large periods of time. So this is the idea of uniformitarianism. Nothing that we see on Earth requires any more explanation than the processes that we ourselves observe commonly. So uniformitarians, such as Hutton and Lyell, they estimated the ages of the rock formations that they found there in England based on the known rates of sedimentation, erosion, etc. And they back calculated this and extrapolated the age of the Earth to be at least 300 million years old. But that was based just on the formations that they found in England. Darwin recognized that these formations in England that were at least 300 million years old were relatively recent compared to some of the formations that are seen elsewhere in the world. And he estimated that the Earth must be billions of years old, which due to techniques like radiometric dating that we have now actually ends up being the true age of the Earth, about four and a half billion years old. So that really helps to refute one of these main criticisms of evolution, of transmutation, of this gradual change of species through time, that there simply was not enough time available. Now there are billions and billions of years for these changes to happen. It's a lot more likely that the diversity that we see in the world can be explained based on these small, minute changes over time when there's that much time for this to work. Another problem for special creation is this idea of extinction. If there was a single creation event that created all the species in the world just exactly as we know them now, well, first of all, if species went extinct, eventually we'd run out of species if there were no new acts of creation to generate more species. But it also created doubt in people's minds about the creator's plans. Why would a creator create species only for them just to go extinct? So one of the greatest, um, earliest documenters of these extinct species was a Frenchman known as Georges Cuvier also known as the Pope of Bones. He was one of the first paleontologists, one of the earliest functional morphologists. So uh, Cuvier was one of the earliest scientists to study this relationship between form and function, the idea that you can infer something about what an organism did with its various body parts based on how those body parts were shaped and formed. And Cuvier documented many, many extinctions. So he found, he analyzed remains of things like mastodons, Irish elk, things that resembled species alive today, but were clearly not represented by any living species. So he documented many of these extinctions, but he still did not think that species evolved. He did not believe in this transmutation of species. So he believed that extinctions were the result of periodic catastrophes, followed by subsequent acts of creation. So the reason we don't find modern species in the fossil record oftentimes is perhaps they were the result of another creation, and then we don't have this problem of running out of species as things went extinct. So he was definitely in this catastrophism camp. He did not believe in gradual change through time. In fact, because he believed so strongly in this very, very close connection between form and function, he really believed that every organism was so ideally suited to whatever functions it performed that any slight change in any aspect of the morphology of that animal would result in a complete destruction of the function of that part. So he actually believed that gradual change through time was impossible just because the animal could not possibly perform as well with any altered version of uh, the structure that it 